Hey, everybody, welcome into the Raw Knuckles podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you'd like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You don't show up late for your first day of That's work true. either, by the way. That's true. I was. I was <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt. I, was I had over. to. I was 23. My, if I, my alarm went there off, I slept through it. And I arrived 40 minutes late for my very first shift. And he said, This is not a good way to start. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious and I was malicious. And I don't care. <laughs> Welcome, Mitch, to the show. And obviously, people don't know my friend Mitch. Um, he does the drive show on TSN here in Montreal, Melnick in the afternoon. There's nobody, nobody that, in my estimation, that mixes sports, music, um, and just good, uh, honest talk every day from three to seven in Montreal. And um, Mitch been just a great friend to me, helped me get into the radio business. And for that, I'll forever be grateful. So welcome to the show here, Mitch, today. Awesome to have you, bud. Thank you. Thanks for the invite, Chris. Yeah. Um, There's some symmetry here. You know, I was, I spent so much of my youth listening to WBZ in Boston yeah. and Larry Glick and uh, Bob Wilson calling Bruins games and, uh, um so yeah it's 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 good to be on the other end of this especially somebody who hails from boston and yeah. who's the other dude I'm, the I'm, other dude here is tim stapleton. sidekick yeah tim stapleton nice <laughs> to meet you mitch nice I, to meet uh, you tim how did i what was your first i just met me and chris just met you know not too long ago what was your first impressions when you first met chris uh i think the first <laughs> well, he, Chris's reputation preceded him in Montreal, and I was a guy who, who grew up in the 60s, you know, later 60s. I was a kid, but John Ferguson was my favorite player, you know, who was probably the toughest player in my lifetime. He was menacing, but he could play the game. He was a hulking figure. He wore 22, and he terrorized everybody in the NHL, especially some Bruins guys, Ted Green. Um, so I was always on the lookout for a player who, who had a similar – uh, background to Fergie, and we had heard about this guy uh, Chris Nyland, uh, who was drafted at the very end, the very bottom of the draft. But I, I used to keep track. I used to keep my own statistics every day before, long before the internet. I'd read hockey summaries and uh, I'd update my own stats. But I also kept track of the Canadians Farm Club in Nova Scotia, which was hard to do. But I managed to do it, and thanks again to the Montreal Gazette for printing their summaries. And I kept noticing this nylon fighting, nylon fighting, nylon fighting, nylon misconduct. <laughs> uh, so I, I started paying attention. And then when he joined the team, I think, Chris, you got into fights almost immediately, right? Yeah. Uh, when you were called up in the, into yeah. the NHL. But you could also you could also see that the, the, there was something to his game. Like he, he appeared th to, to threaten when he had the puck in the other zone. He, and he was a guy that clearly uh, other teams, you know, gave a little room to, but once he established himself, uh, it was, you know, it was like, here's, here's Fergie too. Uh, and just like John Ferguson, who once scored 29 goals playing alongside Belovo and Cornway, it was obvious that Chris had the hands to, to put the puck in the net. And uh, you became a favorite of just about everybody in Montreal. Is that the Ferguson? Like I, when I was in, when I was in Toronto, Ferguson was a uh, GM. Was that, is that related? That's his son. son. That's okay. That was his okay. son. Yeah. And, yeah, and and it's awesome to be compared to someone like John Ferguson. I had the, the pleasure of meeting him uh, for sure, and just an awesome guy. He was he was so cool. Um, and, and and Mitch and I, I guess I I want to get go back to you in your beginning, and I you know you have such a passion for sports, baseball for sure. You played the game growing up, hockey. Uh, music like you, you, you there's some depth to you my friend and um I, I i don't know sure it comes through on your show for sure uh every day from three to seven but i don't think people really know where it all began with you like when when i say all began not just in the radio business we know cfcf where you started back in 81 
But how did how did it start? You you mentioned BZ in Boston, Larry Glick, all that. Um, so, and how did that come as a as a young kid growing up in in Shawmany? Um, where'd this all come from? Yeah, Shawmany Laval, just north of the city. I was a child of radio, Chris, and I don't know. It's difficult to explain to young people what a small transistor radio was. Yeah, but we carried it around with us. You know, back in the, when they used to regularly play day games in Major League Baseball, and uh, we were on our bikes, and we had a I had a transistor radio in my pocket. And I fell asleep to Expos games on the West Coast. And I'm so when the Expos arrived, when they were born in 1969, I was 10. So I started listening to the radio. But my dad, my parents also had a, 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 uh, a clock radio, but an old school kind of antique looking clock radio. And I started playing around with that. And it was powerful enough to, to bring in all of the 50,000 watt stations at night. And my dad used to my dad used to drive me around. I have something very similar, as I discovered, to Bob Costas's background. But I don't think my father gambled as much as his dad did. But in order to, to listen to the games, a lot of the games, before they got the radio, he drove me around in his fury around Shawmany at night. He'd tell my mom we'd be going out for, to Dairy Queen or something and uh, pizza and French fries, whatever. But he would drive me around. We'd drive all over Shawmany so he could listen to the games on the car radio he realized that I was becoming, uh, that I was missing when he wasn't around. He was a salesman. So there was a lot of time that I spent without my dad around. And I asked him if I could listen, I couldn't drive the car. And so they got that radio and I started to pull in. I discovered up and down the dial, like I mentioned, WBZ, KDK in Pittsburgh, uh, KMOX St. Louis, we could bring in, uh, uh, New York, uh, WTIC Hartford, they had the Whalers, um, all those stations. There's a station in Buffalo at the far right of the dial. We could, I think, WJR in Detroit. So all of these stations I discovered, 3WE in Cleveland, Pete Franklin, who was a tremendous talk show host. But a lot of these stations, when there wasn't a game on, I was so used to you know going up and down the dial trying to find a game. Uh, at night, they had a lot of political talk shows. And that's where I became... Uh, aware of what was going on beyond my little world of uh, sports, my little sandbox. And, uh, and, and again, I rarely slept. I slept in a lot as a kid because I listened all night to Larry Glick, who I thought was just incredibly entertaining. And I learned so much. I think I learned a lot about radio, um, listening to so much radio as a, as a kid and becoming aware of things outside of, uh, of, of Shawmany Laval. That connection with your dad, I think, you, you said it, driving in the car with your dad, changing the stations. You know, I remember being in the car with my dad. He put on one station, that was it. You were listening to that boring music, and he was having a couple of beers on the way down to the beach. That was my <laughs> in-the-car yeah. experience with my dad. Now, um, you know, all that and, you know, getting that radio and, and, and listening to the talk shows and stuff like that, what um, – how about Montreal itself? How about the stations here in Montreal? You will listen to all these other ones, but what's the, sh I guess, the show or the person who kind of grabbed you in the Montreal area uh, that, that really enticed you into the radio? Well, his name was Ted Teven. That was the first sports talk show that we had here. It was very uh, gruff, colorful, uh, uh, at times condescending, but it was an act. It was shtick that he was doing. And it was based on a guy named Pat Burns, not to be confused with the former coach, who had this raspy voice, and he did more of a general talk show. And he had moved to Vancouver. We had some uh, language issues uh, here in Montreal in the 70s. Pat Burns got caught up with that. He moved 3,000 miles away to Vancouver. Ted kind of stole his act a little and applied it to sports and life. And and I was like a member of a cult in the in the early 70s when Ted started and he'd be on from 11 to midnight and uh, we'd all discuss what Ted said the night before. But we were also spoiled here in Montreal, Chris. We had Danny Gallivan, who was the best hockey announcer I've ever heard in my life with Dick Irvin. And we had Dave Van Horn uh, and, and Russ Taylor and later Duke Snyder doing Expos games. So uh, th that was that was here in Montreal. And it's been a constant across all sports in Montreal. We've been lucky. We were very fortunate. I learned so much from from those people, and then getting to know them and realizing that they were, you know, most of them were 
uh, just incredible. And, and to know, to hear from the people you grew up listening to later on, to hear from them that they were fans of what you were doing, what I was doing, was just meant the world to me. Well, <clears throat> it's funny, you know, Tim, Mitch and I, uh, we couldn't be more different politically, uh, me to the right, Mitch to the left. And um, with good friends, like today, it's almost you, if you're on one side politically, and on the other, politically, you know, there's so much dislike and division in the world today. And when I look at our relationship, um, I wish our relationship could be that way for the rest of the people in the world. It's like, you know, the the division is crazy. But that being said, um, in, in Mitch... Um, you think I'm to the left? <laughs> no, just, the just a little bit. You're a left winger. I'm a right okay, winger. Okay, let me let me. Tim's a, a Tim's let a center right. Yeah, let's let's get no. this correct, right? Mitch? Let me let me <laughs> throw let me throw this out at you. Okay, marijuana. Yeah. Uh, now I I'm not a pothead. I smoke marijuana. Yeah. But I'm not. When I was younger, I was a pothead, but I grew out of that, and occasionally I still, uh, I still use it. But I've always believed, like ba back when I was a kid, it made no sense to me, zero sense that marijuana should be illegal. I, I, you know, and then I realized the, the money involved and the, and the interest groups and, and, and the uh, medical association and all that. And it took forever to get to the stage. I still can't believe it's not legal in every state. It's ridiculous. Crazy. But isn't that, isn't that, isn't that, a, I remember when major conservative figures, including William F. Buckley, came out in favor of the legalization of marijuana, which made perfect sense from a conservative point of view. Stay out of my life. If yeah. I choose to, to smoke marijuana to relax as you take a couple of uh, cocktails or yeah. medicinally, yeah. Uh, what business is it of yours to tell me that I can't do that? I think that's a very conservative issue, actually. I so, yeah, no, I, I, so I, agree I, I was going to say, listen. Guys, delayed, huh? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, there's a delay here somewhere. And uh, yeah, Mitch, the. the um, like I don't buy the, the the neocons and way to the uh, to the the right stuff, but you know, I I actually, you know, I I listen to you and I I agree with a lot of things that you do say and and, and not so much say but stand for, um, but not everything and that's okay and like I said we get along but I, and I think back of how this relationship, our relationship developed. And, it, you know, I remember the first time I saw you come in the locker room with that big fucking Sony boombox. Tape machine, uh, yeah. Tape yeah. machine with your m microphone, you and Elliot. Yeah, and Elliot Price. You, yeah, Elliot Price. And I'll never forget it. You come in and, it, and again, I, I was leery of the media to some extent early going because you heard the talk from your teammates and this and that. And, and, and then I warmed up. Red Fisher was that cold, timid soul. He acted like it. And then, you know, once you got to know him it was great, but that, that, going with that's 81. I mean, you've been in this business 40 years and, and how did, how difficult from being a fan of the game of hockey and the glorious Canadians, how difficult was it to s keep that a little bit separate when you were doing your job, starting out? Like, I'm a fan, but I also got to do this. Was that difficult for you? No. Uh, I think that the, the difficult part for me was when I first started, and I started coming face-to-face -face with a lot of people that I, you know, that I admired or in some cases feared. You know, I was intimidated. Uh, often my knees would be shaken holding that that microphone. Uh, but, you know, you get over that. You, you, you grow out of that. And I was taught when I was um, um, hired by a gentleman by the name of Bob Dunn hired me. I was working at CFCF Radio, which is the oldest radio station. doesn't exist anymore. It was the oldest station. It beat KDKA. They claimed to be the oldest station in North America. It was actually CFCF Radio, Canada's first, Canada's finest. Uh, and they hired me away in 1982 when I was 23 years old. Bob Dunn was his name. He had been a uh, beat writer for the Montreal Star. He covered the uh, Expos. And he laid down a lot of me. He, he taught me and Elliot and Chris Cuthbert, by the way, yeah. uh, who uh, was still active on Sportsnet calling games. 
to me, the conversation that, that we had, he, he made it clear. This is what you do and what you don't do. If you if you walk into an establishment well, and well, you see... you don't show up late for your first day of work either, by the that's way. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I was... Sorry to was, interrupt. I had to... I was hung over. I was 23. My, if my go. alarm went off, I slept through it. <laughs> and I arrived 40 minutes late for my very first shift. And he said, this is not a good way to start. <laughs> and I really understood what Larry Parrish, the former third baseman of the Expo, said years later when I asked him, about getting booed by expo fans he said hey listen i was single i was in my 20s and i was in montreal there were there were nights i deserved to get booed i wasn't in any shape to play um but he i i learned so much from him don't don't you know you see a group of athletes in a in an establishment get out uh never let if you do uh, meet somebody privately make sure they don't pay for you just certain old school journalistic standards right and uh you know, I I, <laughs> I got a lesson in in uh, I could I could talk about it now. Yeah. I mean, there were there were some players we don't judge. that I we was don't close judge. to with with the Expos and uh, Mike Lansing and uh, Moises Alou, um, those two in particular. There were a couple others, but um, we had agreed to uh, meet one night, and I said, "I'll you know I'll take care of you guys. You just name the restaurant." And they said, "No, no, no." If you want to hang out, you hang with us. You you go where we go, and uh, so we started out at some uh, Italian joint, and then we went to a strip joint. Then we went to a bar, and then we went to a strip joint, and then we went to uh, a late night uh, burger place, and then we went to a strip joint. And I went, man, these guys are just—I mean, how do they do this every night? And I realized they're professional athletes. You know, they could they could work it off, but that was that was a life. That was a life I really didn't have any interest in. I, I enjoyed the partying. I enjoyed the drinking. But uh, I didn't need that other stuff. I was personally very content. No, I was just going to say, do, how, are, how are the Montreal fans with uh, Chris? Is he a big fan? Of, of those oh, he, Chris like a folk hero. No way. He's got a great French accent uh, impersonation, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of the, part of the charm uh, uh, is, uh, you know, what, what, again, the way that Chris played. I think Chris would have been a fan favorite wherever he played, but specifically in Montreal, it's like it's the Boston Montreal rivalry, but there's also great respect, I think, for because they're both two historic cities. There are a lot of similarities, really. Um, but that Boston accent certainly adds a charm. And I, I just, uh, you know, everybody, everybody came to know how generous Chris was with his time away from the ice, the visits, the unannounced visits to the, to the children's hospital, which at the time was right across the street from the Montreal forum. And, uh, he, he was, he's just, Chris is, you know, it, it hurt. Um, it, it, it hurt to lose him on the, on the radio, certainly. Uh, but, uh, I, it, I think everybody feels like they, they know him so well because they also appreciate the fact that he returned here. You know, it's very rare for an American whether they, whatever sport they played, or even a Canadian for that matter, from somewhere else in Canada to return to the place where they made a name for themselves. I mean, that's, uh, you know, Chris, Chris is a Montrealer. He's, he's definitely one of us and he embodies everything that we love about the city. We, you know, he's strong. Uh, he's, he's giving, he's kind, uh, and he's tough. Uh, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good legacy to have, I think. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And I, I, um, when I think of the city and I go back and it, 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 my addiction, the issues I had after hockey, certainly no, no secret to anybody. Uh, I've been, um, uh, extremely, um, vulnerable and open with my issues. And, and, in in that, um, I've helped some other people, which is a, a awesome feeling, but you know, when you're in the situation I was in, and Tim, you can probably attest to this too, um, it's not like everybody's going to be there when you're trying to get back on your feet and say, hey, listen, I'm going to throw out a hand to you here. And when I got sober the last time, Mitch, I did a couple hits on his his show, Weekly Hit. He'd have me on. And um, and at one point, he he said, hey, would you ever be interested in doing the radio uh, here in Montreal, coming on? And I said, yeah, I'd love to, blah, blah, blah. So he set up a meeting with uh, his boss, Wayne Buse, awesome guy, by the way. Um, 
And I came into town. I met the two of them. And we sat down. Tim, it's hilarious. And here we are talking about the radio. I didn't know the first thing about it. About, I, nothing. Nothing at all. And, you know, Wayne asked me some questions. And he said, hey, would you move back here? And, I, you know, it, I said, yeah, I'd move back. And I remember I left. And we finished the meeting. I talked to Mitch. And Mitch said, yeah, you know, Wayne just doesn't think he'll move back. He said, no way he's moving back here, right? And all of a sudden, maybe, I don't know, maybe eight months later, who moved back? And now it's like, so Mitch really pushed for me, and and he was the pull that brought me back here. I love the city, uh, and I was trying to get back on my feet. And I understand when people are going to say, we ain't going near that guy, the issues, the whole thing. I get it. And I understand it. I accept it. But Mitch was the one guy that when I say I'm eternally grateful to because he helped to get me this opportunity in radio. And I wouldn't be sitting here today with you, Tim, if not for Mitch. And, and, and you know, sorry, you know, Tim. You, no, I was gonna say I was gonna sorry, say I was Tim. I'm I was gonna say that I'm glad that uh, Chris got fired. <laughs> Which is a good thing. But, you know, I didn't know the first thing, Tim. I was scared. Jamie, the f- first night, the night before my first show, I was so nervous. I was so scared. Jamie said to me, oh, my God. She said, what is wrong? I said, I'm, I'm scared to death. I, I, Mitch, I was, you don't even have a clue. I was never scared before a Philadelphia hockey game in Philly or Boston like I was scared the night before the radio, I didn't know a lick. And it's like you held out your hand to get me that job. But Jesus, you just threw me in the deep end. That's the way to do it. Right. I mean, uh, but but nobody, nobody, there was no, we didn't have the time and we didn't have the resources. We didn't even have the space to have a, a separate studio so you could do some mock shows. I mean, I just knew you're just a, you're a great storyteller. You, you communicate very well and you're well read and it was just all it was going to take is a, maybe a week worth of shows. You did have somebody, you know, in the studio with you who, who had a f- some years of experience in, in Sean Campbell. Oh. And that, that was it. I mean, the people, there, was not, there was nothing you couldn't – there was nothing you could do or say that was going to turn people away. People were – people are – People knew you and love you and respect you, so they were willing to live with a couple of weeks of uh, rough patches. And <laughs> a <couple> th- that's <laughs> <laughs> a little more than that. It wasn't just about helping Chris, uh, because I I knew that he'd be he'd be good at it. It was also about helping us as a radio station. You know, we we we, we need, you, it was the perfect timing, and it was it was a, you you were the perfect guy to 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 do it. And I knew how badly. You wanted to resurrect your life here in Montreal, and so it just uh, it was a series mm. of events that led to it. So I, I don't, you know, I appreciate what you say, Chris, and I, w- I would have done it. I think no matter what I was doing in life, uh, but it also yeah, helped yeah. us. Yeah. It really helped us as a radio well, cool. station. I was gonna say because uh, it, 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 this is hard. Like even just uh, this is new to me, and I think. Uh, that one thing you said about John Madden was like, just, you know, be yourself. And like when I, that, that's hard to do. I, I mean, I mean, but I can, from the outside with Chris meeting him, like right away, I was like, man, this guy just, you, you when he talks, you want to listen. And I, I completely see what you're talking about with him. Like he just, uh, just be yourself, but it is hard. It's hard. Got a lot of respect. Just don't cross him, Tim. <laughs> don't cross him. He's a great friend, but he's a strong enemy. <laughs> Wow. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, talking. Um, Not that you hold a grudge or anything. No. <laughs> yeah, let, never, listen. never. So I'm assuming all those things you said about Chris uh, applied to me too. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, I had to no. Google you, Tim. I'm <laughs> I sorry. Know. No, I was, <laughs> after all these things you're saying, I'm like, and now Chris ended up with me. So things are going good, Chris. You're on the right path. But uh, I said you got Mike Stapleton doing a show with you. Yeah. Mike you know? Stapleton. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. What would you have advice? What kind of advice would you have for someone like me? I mean, I just honestly, like, I have no experience in this. I just, uh, I've been doing this maybe Listen. as long as. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. 
Listen. That, that, that's the best advice I can give you. The best advice that I got, I, when I was a kid, when I was 17 years old, I applied to every radio station across Canada uh, to work in a news department. And nobody responded except one guy who ran a station. At, it was CKBB in Barrie, Ontario, well north of Toronto. And the first line, what he wrote me was, you got a lot of nerve applying to my station. Like, I was horrendous. I must have sounded like this, like not exactly the voice of authority, right? Your and, balls didn't drop yet? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, hadn't, I hadn't started drinking my dad's shivas. Um, but he, he, uh, he must have heard something because he responded. And then he wrote a letter, which started that way. But he said, here's what you have to do. You got to read and read and read and keep reading, especially about things you don't know. And then get to the point where whatever you're reading, including your local papers, read it out loud. Read everything out loud. And then apply in a year. And I did that. And, it, you know, it's an education. You know, read about stuff you don't know. Well, I'm interested in a lot of stuff, but I'm very, very curious by nature. And I think you got to be if you're, if you're going to communicate with people. And a, a year later, I reapplied. And he wrote back. He said, we still don't have any room here, but there's a vast improvement. Keep going. You're, you're going to be okay. I wish I knew who the guy was. I wish I had the letter. But shortly after that, we had an all-news radio station open up uh, on the West Island in Montreal. And uh, that was my first job. And I got hired when I was 18 years old. And uh, I, I did everything. I literally did everything. I produced talk shows. I, I wrote news for news anchors. Uh, whatever they wanted me to do, I did. Occasionally, I got on the air. And the first event I covered was the... Uh, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard fight at Olympic wow. Stadium in 1980. Wow. And then I felt, okay, this is, I'm moving in the right direction here. I'm, I'm at this fight that everybody across the world is interested in. And, um, and then um, eventually I, I got hired by CFCF Radio and I started doing sports full time and took a sabbatical a few years in because I felt my, my life was moving too quickly. I needed to slow down a little. Um, and 40, 43 years into the business, I can't believe I'm still doing it. To get back to, I guess, this city, the love affair, and the Habs, and, and the passion of this city and the people, what do you think, of, what is so great about playing here? Because there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of fucking bullshit that goes along with being a Montreal Canadian that people don't see. They just see all the, oh, you know, everybody loves you. Yeah. Sometimes it can it can be overbearing. Sometimes I'm embarrassed by my own profession. I got to be honest with you. I think when we lost the Expos here, uh, then it became funneled. Everything became funneled to the Canadians. There was no break. You know, before even if the if the Canadians didn't make the playoffs, at least we had a Major League Baseball season to look forward to and discuss and dig into. So it's it's all encompassing. And and with the proliferation of of podcasts and and blogs and all of that, you got. You got more and more people, you know, social media, I, you know, I, I, I can't wait for the, for the moments when I take a break from my job so I can completely unplug. I think we all spend way too much time on our phones. I think it's, it's kind of sad, actually, what's happened. I think as, as everything explodes and technology allows us to go where we've never gone before, I think less and less people are spending time talking to each other, uh, like speaking to each other. Um, but but the Canadians are you know Chris you arrived here the Canadians were were uh, just coming off a, a four consecutive Stanley Cup run, you know uh, people talk about the dynasty of the fifties five in a row in the late fifties and the dynasty of the seventies four in a row in the late seventies they forget about the dynasty of the sixties yeah. the Canadians were uh, a powerhouse in the nineteen sixties they only got they only missed that nineteen sixty seven win by the Leafs. Otherwise, they would have won. A, that, that would have been another team that's remembered as winning consecutive Stanley Cups. Yeah. Uh, so that you have that built in with Rocket Richard's, you know, basically putting the Montreal Canadiens on the map. The house the Rocket built uh, was the Forum. So that's that's built in the lore, the history, the championships. Even though, in in generation by generation you're more removed from that it's there it's part of the dna uh, of the city of montreal the montreal canadians that'll never change so it's unfortunate that as more and more people have access to information and follow the canadians as deeply as they do you know they've had less and less success although that final run was 
was thrilling and it really helped heal the city through the pandemic last summer. It was, uh, it was very emotional to see that, but, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, you take the good with the bad, right? As a player, I can't. You could relate more yeah. than I can as an ex-player, but I'm sure there are players who, you know, on their way to practice or whatever, or after a game, uh, if they were listening to the radio, they turn it off. They listen to music. Like you don't need that. You don't need the aggravation because every moment in every hockey game uh, is is uh, I think it's is overanalyzed. As That's most just- of you know, I'm a dog person. I have a St. Bernard. Her name is Adele. Why do I feed Adele formula raw? Because I love her. I want to provide her with a healthy, well-balanced, locally sourced diet. A diet that consists of meat, chicken, fish, mixed with fruits and vegetables that her 140 pounds requires. I also feed her formula raw because it helps her overall energy, it helps her with allergies, and helps strengthen her overall immune system. Dimitri and Nick at Formula Raw have worked tirelessly over the last 10 years to perfect their recipe, and they've got it because you know how I know? Adele loves it. She never, never misses a meal, and she's a healthy, big, beautiful St. Bernard. When I first came on the... uh, into this the radio business mitch had said to me listen sports boom stay away from politics religion boom boom and then i would hear him some days and he'd be talking about those things and i'm like mitch why can't i do that but i got it and i'm glad i didn't because if i have strong views on something boy does it open up a can of worms with listeners you know and the next thing everything is coming at you no good son of a and yeah so but i hear you like i there's a lot of times i wanted to maybe say some things about certain situations in the world and i couldn't i couldn't whether you know it's russia or china what's going on in the u.s the president i have this to say i think the president is like he shouldn't be there a lot of things and i just button up knuckles and so i i was muted a little bit only because of and and i was muted myself but you also had a shorter show you had a two-hour show yeah i got a four-hour show yeah and and one of the things that happened when i was given a four-hour show it was uh um i said okay i'll do four hours because we were talking about three hours uh i'll do four hours but the first hour is mine you got to trust me that if the Canadians make a big trade, that's what we're going to talk about. But on de- those days when there's nothing happening, there's no real issue. I want to talk about uh, uh, an artist. I want to talk about uh, what might have gone down on Saturday Night Live over the weekend. I want to talk about what I want to talk about it and, and trust me on it. And that was, you know, 30 years ago. So, like, I, I'm, I'm not dumb enough to, you know, purposely, you know, cause, a, cause an issue. Uh, uh, with any kind of political rant, that's not what I am. But uh, um, it's it's part of who I am. AM radio, personality radio, talk radio is basically personality driven radio. And people have been listening to me for forty years. Those newbies who just like who is this old dude, you know, <laughs> dissecting a, a Dylan song? Well, yeah. if that turns you off, that's not the kind of person I want listening to me anyway. I could care less. We occasionally get complaints. Why do you play a song at the, at the start of your show? Eh, I've been doing that for 35 years. And if you're paying attention, there's a reason why that particular <laughs> song is being played. And even if three people get it, I've made my point. You have the um, production company, Billy Bob Productions. You just did the 80th birthday bash of Dylan back in November, right? That's and right. I, yeah. I, I watched um, uh, the video clips of that, uh, which was awesome. Uh, seeing Bilal and, and, and Jason Rockman and, and, uh, Anakin singing, uh, about hurricane, the hurricane, hurricane. I, I, yeah. I, that was awesome. But th- that whole part of your life, the music part, but the Billy Bob production, how did, like, how did that 
come about? Yeah, yeah, you love the music, I get it, but what made you want to get into the production piece of that? Well, I hadn't thought of that at all, but one of the things I did was was uh, expose my listeners to music, new mu- newer music that I was listening to, sometimes tipped up by Ted Blackman, who, who made me cassettes. He made his best friends mix cassettes back in the day uh, and, and shared his love of these particular artists, and I still have them. And uh, there was one guy he told me about named Jimmy Lafave who had this incredibly soulful voice. He's from Oklahoma by way of Texas. And uh, I, I just started playing it. It was a combination of Van Morrison, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a criminal lawyer. There was a criminal lawyer in Montreal named Lloyd Fishler who was listening to my show. We hadn't met. He was also uh, listening to Jimmy Lafave and went to the hills of Vermont to see him give a concert for about a hundred people or so. And he came back and um, I ended up meeting him at a f- concert by the Wallflowers, Bob Dylan's son, Jacob Dylan. And we started talking and he said, listen, uh, I, I saw this guy, Jimmy Lefebvre. I know you play him on your song. I'd like to bring him to Montreal. Do you think you could help get the word out? And that's what I did. I started, I started promoing his show and like several hundred people came out. It was like, Oh, uh, this this could work. I have the ability to uh, inform. Lloyd does all the work. Uh, we had a money guy, Gary Silverman, and uh, what we were we started doing a lot of small shows, bringing a lot of American singer songwriters who, for whatever reason, had been passed over uh, Montreal visits, and we started bringing them to Montreal and started getting a following. And we didn't we weren't making money. We didn't care about making money. We all had full time jobs. We just. We, we were such lovers of music and we wanted to share it. And we thought it was unfair that we had to travel to see some of our favorite artists. So we started bringing them to Montreal and putting them in clubs. Uh, and our greatest one was John Prine, who had never been asked to play Montreal, the folk legend who died during the first wave of the pandemic. And we sold out a 1200 seat mm. club here in Montreal. All he wanted was a, a genuine French meal. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a career change. It's it's a hobby. It's more of a, of a hobby. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So if you oh, ever Korea- see the logo of Billy Bob Productions, you know the music is good. Yeah, well, the career change. Let's let's. I want to ask you this one: You mm-hmm. love the sport. You love sports. You love music, <clears throat> baseball, hockey. <clears throat> if Mitch could do something, have done something else in his life, what would it have been? The rock star, uh, Guy Lafleur, um, you know, Babe Ruth. I don't know which one. <laughs> Or, had, or is it neither of them? No, I had dreams like a lot of kids that they were. It was so disappointing to wake up from, because the dreams were so vivid. Skating <laughs> on the Montreal Forum and scoring goals, they were so vivid. They, it was like, oh shit! Uh, you know, you wake up. It's like that's not my life. Uh, but I, I think I had the next best thing to that: being able to spend so much time in the Forum and other rinks and the Bell Center and ballparks across America and of course here in Montreal. Uh, so, so yeah, it, I think maybe a, a, a writer chronicling music, you know, um, if, if you said, can you go back and do it again? I don't, I, you know, I, I don't like to look back, but if, if, if you were to force me to say, you know, what, if you had to start all over again, would you do the same thing? I wouldn't want anything changed personally. I have two great kids. But uh, professionally, I, I would have done a little more writing, I think. Like, kind of, Hunter S. Thompson is another hero. Oh, I was going to get that. I was going to get that. Hit, Mitch's Twitter handle is Hunter Thompson. So, yeah, what, what is it He with just Hunter? made me laugh. It was like this combination of being uh, informed, entertained, and just, you know, reading a style that I had never been exposed to before because he basically invented it and he was so smart and so funny. Like that's, that's the thing. That's another piece of advice. Always try to bring a piece of humor. It's, you know, people like to laugh. Um, so I, I just remember just laughing out loud, uh, reading, um, I know everybody points to fear and loathing in Las Vegas, but to me it was fear and loathing on the campaign trail in 1972 when he covered the uh, McGovern-Nixon campaign. And the stories Mm -hmm. in there are just hysterical. He invented some shit up that people took seriously. So he kind of blurred the lines between, you know, fiction and nonfiction, but he could write. 
he made the pages come alive. Yeah, I saw a special on him. He was a pretty uh, interesting guy, you know. And the only reason why I looked at it, honestly, is because of you. I'm there. Well, why is Mitch got this? Well, Alex Gibb, they made, a, they made the documentary on him. Yeah. Right? Didn't he produce yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Among, awesome. among a few others. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I, I've got that, uh, you know, uh, I, I, think I, w I think we're all born a certain way. And I think, uh, I don't know how, if there's some mysticism about it, but we, we all are uh, a, attracted to people or, or uh, personalities that kind of reinforce, I think, what's already there. It just takes it to another level. And you connect, right? People connect with, you know, I realize that people live vicariously through people who are well known uh but it's more about having a connection it's like a, a songwriter that's exactly how i feel thank you for this it's it uh, you know anything that touches your heart any art form that touches your heart is like a gift and so all the, these people have been gifts for me personally i can't imagine my life without them let me uh throw this at you if and i always hear people say oh, i got no regrets no regrets i i got regrets in life what what's your biggest regret jeez uh, well i regret the fact that my marriage didn't work out we're still best friends same here yeah yeah, yeah that's my biggest regret in life because, yeah because you know, we grew up we my ex-wife and i grew up together we met when we were 11 years old and you know we're both the same age she's about to turn 63 and i'll turn 63 a couple of months later and we have these two amazing children uh, and I know when we split up, even though we remained friends, I literally moved across the street when we split up. Um, it, it was hard on them. Um, so I, re I, you know, I regret that that happened. There's nothing that could have been done to change it, I don't think. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I regret that. But I, I you know, again, uh, it's not like uh, we're living uh, separate lives and never see each other, never communicate. We yeah. do. Uh, a lot. We're still in touch. Which a, a lot, lot of people don't. When they yeah. move on, they did a lot of business. I'm, I, I'm and just I, saying. And I had a relationship, Chris. As you know, I had a long-term relationship. I know that was difficult for my girlfriend at the time to understand why I was still so close to my ex-wife. And yeah. so she's one of my best friends. I've known her. She knows me better than anybody in my life. So yeah. uh, and uh, yeah, so that you know, other than that, I, I don't, you know, I mentioned leaving a television show. I have no regrets about that at all. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly know where you're coming from <clears throat> and I regret because I failed at that marriage and it was yeah, honestly my, it, it was because of me, the way I was living my life. And, and I regret it for that. And I regret that I hurt someone the way I hurt someone. Uh, today, s certainly my life is a whole, whole different story. And uh, <laughs> The, the, you know, Jamie, I mean, for the life of me, I don't know where I'd be without it, to be honest. Like, um, she's been just such, such a wonderful person in my life. My best friend, like I always say, my, my best friends are always guys. She's my best friend. And, and yeah, so. Um, yeah. I would have liked to spend more time with my dad as at the end. Yeah, no, I just, my dad, you know, he, he, uh, he, <laughs> He was not a very, he was not a social butterfly. He kind of clammed up, which has made his job as a salesman. Like, I don't know how he did it. Uh, but I wish there were more times that we could have spent together. I remember when he passed away, he died of a stroke. He was 84. Uh, he had two major bypass operations, 12 years apart. Uh, Stephen Brunt, a great writer here yeah, in Canada, he used yeah. to be a regular on my show. He said, uh, he said, you're going to miss him more later. It's going to kick in later. And that's true. I find myself thinking about my dad uh, more th these days than in the immediate aftermath of his passing because we were, we we all knew he was on his way out, um, that he wasn't going to leave the hospital. So, you know, I just wish there were just a few more conversations. You know, yeah. uh, we used to sit and watch boxing a lot together. We well, he brought me to the forum for the first time. Uh, he made sure my mom and dad made sure I was at the very first uh, baseball game played outside of the United States at Jerry Park in Montreal in 1969. So I, I just wish because he was away a lot that we'd spend a little more time together, but that's life. Yeah. You know, hey, hey, listen, I just lost my dad. I, I wish, I wish that thing again, I, I wish I could have talked to him more the morning he died. Like he kind of was in a rush to get off of FaceTime 
And when I look back at it, I, I don't know. He must. He knew something was going on, or knew something. I think he knew death was close, and yeah. like it was just weird how that morning went with us. When I look back and I go over that, but I, I'm grateful. Um, I certainly had repaired some of the not some of the relationship with my dad because it was very boom. We 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 butted heads a lot, and certainly I gave him a lot of um reason for that growing up as a kid as wild as i was but boy um did my getting sober and waking up and coming you know figuring things out that uh relationship was awesome and i still have my mom dementia not good and i you know mitzi right like right, yeah my mom's 90? 90 my mom's 90, 90. she's amazing 90. and uh, we were like, supposed to celebrate god bless for a full week in December, and then everything closed down again. So hopefully, uh, she plans on being here for Mother's Day, and uh, she's going to go crazy. You know, whoever yeah. you want to invite, whatever friends of hers are left. Unfortunately, you know, yeah. at the age of ninety, but she w literally walks miles at the age yeah. of ninety. When I visited it's... her in Toronto, we walked from her <laughs> from uh, downtown hotel to the harbor front by the water, and uh, she had yeah, you I'm lucky it? in that regard. Yeah, I had to sit. You were, you were out like, of Can breath. We take a break here. I'm gonna <laughs> sit on the bench here for a second. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Uh, awesome stuff. Hey, Mitch. Um, awesome uh, to have you on with me here today. It's just been, Thanks. you know, I could keep going all day and just, you know, we could really get into that deep stuff and kind of snap at each other a little bit. But I don't want to do that. Thank you. Something to awesome. look forward to the next time. <laughs> <laughs> 